Hi everyone, my name is Kelly McMeekin um, and I am the Museum Manager for the Museum of um, Scottish Fire Heritage and I'm also joined today by Jim MacDonald who is a retired watch commander for Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and also a volunteer um, at the Museum of Scottish Fire Heritage and today we're going to be talking you through our process of developing a new museum for Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and also our experience of working um, within an organisation that doesn't have museums or heritage as part of its core business and also our experience of working with volunteers who have direct lived experience of a museum subject matter which is where Jim kindly comes in to share his experience today. So just to give a wee bit of context, in 2015, um, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service restructured to become the single Scottish service as we know it today, but previously it had been eight legacy services and the building that our museum was in at the time um, was identified as surplus to requirement which that's an image of the building there it's an absolutely beautiful building um and so when we found out that that building was surplus to requirement that was quite a challenge for us because we obviously didn't feel like it was surplus to requirement at the time um however the building was sold and the collection went into storage um unfortunately and we as a team so we have a very small heritage team within sfrs we went into redevelop mode at that time if you like so where did that leave us at that time it left us with um a hunt for a new location um, which had to be ideally within edinburgh city and it also left us with um a really dedicated and vocal cohort i'm sure you won't mind me saying that um cohort of volunteers who were very concerned about the future of the museum and very concerned about the future of the collection. I think essentially there was a deep worry that the collection would go into storage and probably never make it back out again and obviously we kind of had to do a lot of work to, to make sure that that did not happen. So as I said we kind of went into redevelopment mode at that point. So it took a wee while for us to really kick the project off um, from the, the closure of the building in 2016 to us really um, looking at the development process for the new museum. And one of the things that came up during that process was that we in the previous museum had a collection that was very... Um, locally based if you like so the collection had been built on the history of edinburgh and um, fire engine establishment and also Lothian and borders fire brigade which were the two legacy brigades if you like um and our new museum was going to be telling a scotland wide story because we were a scottish wide service now so we had to look at how we developed that we also had to look at the practicalities of designing a new space so the the location that was eventually chosen for us was that we were going to be part of a community fire station and um, so we went back on site into a living and working fire station we have our own wing if you like in that building and um, we also had to do a lot of object research as well because as i said we were trying to create a new story essentially with the collection that we already had and we also really started to engage with our volunteer cohort at this time. So um, one of the things that we wanted to do was make sure that our volunteers were kind of involved from the start. So finding out from them what their interests were within the collection. So we have um, people like Jim, who he's going to speak a little bit more in a minute, but his interest in appliances and very practical looking after and maintenance um, and how we could kind of feed that into building what the interpretation and what the displays might be. So, you know, we kind of really looked at what people were passionate about, what they were interested in. We had some people that had no interest in stuff like that and just wanted to help us pick images for the museum. So that was great. We spent a lot of time going through archives and looking for images and making sure that people felt like their contribution was recognised really and that they were involved in the, the process of developing this new site. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of... Um, internal discussions a lot of advocacy as i mentioned the organization we work for 
museums and heritage are not part of the the core business so we did have a lot of um advocacy work to do internally to get people on board with even with the fact that the project was happening and how they could feel like they were part of the process as well um timeline for us has been really challenging throughout this whole process um we were scheduled to begin work in the actual museum um, in the summer of 2020 but i think as most people um will know that did definitely not happen um <laughs> And yeah, so it was a further um, two years actually before we ended up getting back on site um, with the main works taking about a year um, to evolve on site. So what we're looking at here is the shell of the building on the left hand side um, in February 2022 when we eventually got onto site. Um, February 2023, what it looks like now. Um, I think one of the main challenges for us in terms of lockdown, everyone had huge challenges in every aspect of life through that point. But I think for us, we were part of a very risk averse organisation um, and SFRS was very focused on protecting the front line. Um, which means that protecting the firefighters essentially are on operational duties because we were part of the same footprint of building we were we had to abide by their rules as well so we couldn't access um, our site maybe as much as we would have liked we were limited to how many people we could have on board we couldn't access our own collections for a really long time as well so we kind of just had to try and keep engaged through that that long period of waiting to get to get back onto site so when we did eventually get onto site and we were just looking at that shell we were actually still so delighted just to be looking at a concrete block so the fact that we've come so far um, in that time has been wonderful now i'm going to pass you over to jim who's going to tell you a little bit about his um perspective on his volunteering experience have the mic thank you <laughs> Good morning. I suppose my journey into the volunteering side, it includes a part of my fire service career. I was in the fire service for 35 years. And throughout that time, it was always installed into every firefighter that part of your fire service core practice is to protect premises, protect possessions. That's aimed at incidents. But we can relate that to museum side as well, how we are protecting our collection and uh, possessions and looking after it. So my journey really started when I was due to retire from the then Lothian Borders Fire and Rescue Service. And you'd hear rumours going about the brigade, you know, we're amalgamating, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. So... I'd also heard the rumour that, as Kelly said, the museum at Lauriston, which is a beautiful, iconic 1900s Victorian fire station, was going to be closed. They were going to be selling it off. So I thought, I'll take a chance and I'll go down and I'll have a look at the museum and the building for perhaps the last time. So when I went in, I bumped into the volunteer on duty who happened to be an ex-colleague of myself who we had served with for many years and after the talk, the tour, the obligatory fire service cup of tea, a wee bit arm twisting and persuasion, I signed on the dotted line. And I then became the Friday volunteer and spent many happy hours taking people around, passing on what I knew on to the, the general public. So if you go back quite a few years to my very first posting, at my first station. I was posted from the training school to Bathgate Fire Station in West Lothian. We country fire station. And as I walked in the doors, the first thing that caught my eye out the back in the drill ground was a row of old fire appliances, old 1950s, 60s appliances. I thought, what have I come to? And the guys were saying, oh, they're due to be scrapped. They're past, past their life, they're going to be scrapped. Well, it broke my heart when I saw them. Absolutely hand-built, purpose-built fire appliances. Not like the modern things that we're getting nowadays. So I went in and I was taken under the wing of an experienced fireman. 
And that's what we were called in these days, firemen. He took me around the appliances, showed me things that I didn't see at the training school, spoke about things. And we had two full-time appliances, a pump and an emergency tender. The emergency tender used to go to road accidents, incidents where people were trapped, and the pump and appliance. And we also had what was called a retained pump. And that was staffed by firemen who had full-time jobs, but would answer the call on the pager to come to the station and man the appliance. And when we were going round it, he was pointing out a lot of old things and a lot of the equipment was brass, brass branches, brass breechings. So a branch connects onto the end of the hose and that converts pressure energy into kinetic energy. And that's how we managed to get the throw of the water onto the fire. And unfortunately, it was a full-time crew's job to clean all the branch. And water and brass don't really mix. So it was an ongoing job, every day shift, cleaning away. And that was my first tour of duty, three days, three nights. And I thought, is this all we do? Clean brass all the time. So just looking at the equipment, there were several bits of information teeped into the brass and also a painted band round the equipment and that denoted the station identification colours. So if we went to a large incident, as sometimes was a way, oh they've got a better piece of equipment, we'll just take that. It was all colour coded. But looking at the information, it was things like WD, MOD, NFS. And I said to this experienced fireman who went by the name of the Colonel. <laughs> That's not a fire service terminology. How did he get that name? And he wasn't the sort of person who, in my eyes, suffered fools gladly. So I thought, I better no ask. 19-year-old, you know, wanting a clip round the ear. So he explained that following the end of the war, the disbandment of the National Fire Service, and in 1968, the disbandment of the Auxiliary Fire Service and then the Cold War threat sort of weakened all that equipment that was kept on mobile fire columns that was distributed throughout the brigades. So all the old equipment would come round and he says perhaps that branch that you're holding in your hand was used at the Clydebank Blitz or in Aberdeen where it was the second most bombed city in Scotland. He says, if only it could talk, it's got the history. So jumping forward, when we were at the collection store, I found that branch again. It seems to be haunting me all the time. <laughs> so, we're going on to volunteering. Why I volunteer? I feel that I have a duty to protect what is basically my history. You know, we go on, and Edinburgh has a proud tradition that the Edinburgh Fire Establishment was established in 1824. And it was the first municipal fire brigade set up in the United Kingdom, if not the world. And we hold that in a very, very strong sense. So after my time at Bathgate a couple of months, I got pulled into the office thinking, what have I done? And the division officer was sitting there and he says, eh, how are you getting on? How are you enjoying it? Blah, blah, blah. He says, right, you're getting posted to Crutoll Fire Station in the northwest of Edinburgh. Your time here is up. You're getting posted through. Be aware, it's a very, very busy station. He says, it's the busiest in Lothian and Borders. So off I went, joined the White Watch, and at that time we had 18 on the watch. 18 is unheard of nowadays, and it just shows you how the fire service has been cut back to the bone. So we had 18, and we had three appliances, two pumping appliances and a 100-foot turntable ladder. And it was an older, classic appliance. Absolutely beautiful. An old AEC Merriweather. 
and just the shape of it itself, gorgeous. So as things went on, at the time, constantly, very, very busy station where we could average at least four or five house fires a night, along with other uh, incidents, road accidents, fire alarms, the obligatory chimney fires. We had a lot of chimney fires as well. And you learn your job very, very quickly, and I become very, very experienced at those sort of incidents. And as with any group of guys, hijinks and practical jokes take place. So the brigade round about that time were installing museum artefacts within stations. A, so as they could be shown, and B, so as they could be kept clean. And at Crew Toll, we had this gorgeous wooden and glass cabinet with brassware inside it. And we also had what was called a ladder cart with six individual ladders on it, which formed together and it would make one large scaling ladder. And that was positioned in the muster hall below a set of stairs leading up to the divisional offices and the muster hall and the billets. In those days, we had billets where you could get your head down, have a wee rest. And that cart was complemented by a mannequin, or a dummy as we used to call it, dressed in Victorian fire gear, white trousers, cotton trousers, a tunic and a red leather helmet. And that stood at the, the cart quite happily. One night, one particular night shift, we come back from several incidents. We used to go from fire to fire to incident to incident. And every time we got back, our station officer would say, wash your appliances. So we had to wash them, no matter what day, time, night of the year, or whatever, appliances were always washed. And that was a pride thing as well. You turned up with nice, shiny fire engines. The crew tumbled out and we were filthy because we didn't have time, as long as the fire engine was tidy. So we turned up and, needless to say, water fights ensued. And there was a mixture of experience on the watch from young ones called probationers or probies, mid-range and then experienced guys. Some of the guys were due to retire. Grumpy old gets there. And they would be vicious at times and just throw buckets of water for no reason. So water fights carried on. And this went on and one night I was sent out duty to McDonald Road where the original museum was. And it's strange because it's now going back to its old home. So we went there and when you went there as either a driver or a, a fireman to, to fill in, when the station work was being allocated, the bosses would say, oh, I went disappear into the museum. Go and tidy the museum up. Great. Went in there and spent hours just going through records, sitting in the appliances, reading things, listening out for the alarm going. And then I would think to myself, I would quite, quite fancy doing this, you know, all the time and preserving things. And you could see... And, it always had a smell when you walked in the engine room, the oils, the smoke, the leather hose that they had as well. So got back to my own station the following shift, and once again, the usual water fights in between incidents, and one night shift, the grumpies had just been up there. Washed the appliances, we come back, and I disappeared. And I could hear in the background the guys going, where's Jimmy? His tea's getting cold. Where is he? I had gone away and removed the dummy, put the fire, Victorian fire gear on, and I stood there. Stood there at the ladder cart for what seemed to be an eternity. Now, the station was in darkness, and I eventually heard the door opening and the two grumpies coming out with the term, keep that bloody telly down. Here they come. So I could hear them just walking with their wee cups of tea, going up to their bed. And I just happened to say, Good night, gentlemen. <laughs> well, 
I didn't think a grown fireman could scream with his jump as high. Cups in the air, tea all over the place. Just at that, the lights come on and the alarm went. I was caught. Tannoy comes on. All three, meaning all three appliances were going. What did I do? I was caught. So I went out and the rest of the guys are coming through from different areas. Of, what have you been up to? <laughs> Laughing. So I get sent to the old appliance with the Victorian fire gear on. Starts the appliance up. And who was the officer in charge? One of the grumpies. He just looked at me. Shook his head. So we drove. Next morning, seven o'clock, gets Tanoi to the station officer. He's sitting there. I walked in. Big smile on his face, but Grumpy's standing at the back of him. Jimmy. So he gave me a tongue-in-cheek reprimand. He says, yeah, so if you're so keen on museum relics, from now on, your job is cleaning the museum cabinet with all the brasswork. Yes. <laughs> Little did he know what he had started. So this went on and basically we had a great time. You know, it was absolutely brilliant. So as we moved on, the station officer then got transferred to headquarters at the time to the community education department. And his role or one of his remits was looking after the museum at Lauriston. And one day he phones me at home, Jimmy, would you be interested in a wee project? I'm doing, yes, what is it? He says, I would love to get the 1939 Dennis limousine pump back on the road. Now, it was one of the first enclosed fire engines that the Edinburgh Fire Brigade bought. Beautiful old Dennis. So we hatched up plans. Yes, we'll do this, we'll do that. And I contacted Dennis Brothers, who had built the thing back in the 30s, to see if they had any information. A couple of days later, a big package arrives at my home address with all the blueprints, wiring diagrams, pump details, even down to the individual signatures of the guys who had done each stage of the build. Brilliant. Salvaged some wiring loom off old cars, and I started rewiring the fuse box only to be told, stop, the brigade's not wanting to undertake any major renovations. End off. So a quick coat of paint in the cab, and it was left as is. Jumping to last year, Kelly found out just how heavy and cumbersome that appliance was when she had to steer and manoeuvre it into its forever home at the new museum. If only it had been running. And if only it had power steering, Kelly wouldn't have the muscles. It certainly have made the process a lot easier. A lot easier. A lot easier. <laughs> well, I have a personal interest in the appliances that served the fire service. As I say, when I went at Bathgate, we had beautiful, iconic old appliances that were going to be cut up or sold to the scrap man. Nowadays, we have modern, mass-produced appliances. I'll not name the names, but manufacturers make them, and they're all the same. There's absolutely no character about them. When I undertook my, my driving, I became an advanced blue light response driver and drove many, many different types of appliances throughout my career from manual crash gearboxes, which you had to ensure that the revs were in time. If not, you'd get the break of the wrist because the gears would mesh. Right through to the modern day automatics with electric this and electric that. Air sprung seats, so you just select drive and away you go. The old appliances, you had to drive them. You had to read the road. You had to make sure that your braking distances, because a lot of them had what's called vacuum brakes as opposed to air brakes. So you had to have a, a longer braking distance. And they were just so nice to drive. It could tell its own story. 
Let's go. So, how do we get where we are with the information? The contribution to research. As in any workplace, any museum, any workforce, there will always be people who are experts in their own specialisations. And we have two or three volunteers who are very keen on photography, and they have built up a vast array and library of photographs, images, of incidents, of appliances, of fire stations. And that has been very, very helpful in being able to furnish the new museum with those photographs and being able to tell the story of the evolution of the fire service. And it was always installed into me from when I was a 14-year-old apprentice that everybody has got an idea. Nobody should be dismissed from their ideas. From the youngest member right the way through, it doesn't matter who you are, you have an idea. And if you've got that idea, you put it forward and let's talk about it. And that's how I used to run my watch. Everybody contributed. It wasn't a case of, you're doing this, you're doing that. Everybody could have an idea. And we mulled it over. And it worked. And it's the same with the museum. Everybody can put an idea forward to see how it works. We come from a fire service background, coming into Kelly with a museum background, and it blends perfectly together. Just an image of Jim working on one of the flags as we were getting ready um, to open the museum. Um, and now we're going to talk a wee bit about some of the challenges that we've faced. So I think I mentioned earlier the museums and heritage are not core business. Um, and I guess the, the main takeaway from that is that because you have to do a lot of advocacy, particularly internally, um, you kind of need to build in a wee bit extra time to your project um, to get things done. It can just take a bit longer to get that final approval and it might have to go through a bit more process. So that can be challenging. And also people in our organisation don't necessarily value the same things as we do. It's not on their agenda. So um, I would say that's definitely a huge lesson um, for us in that process. Not having a physical space and trying to engage with our cohort of volunteers and also trying to recruit new volunteers when you don't actually have a venue um, is so challenging because people are like, well, I'm not going to sign up to volunteer for a space that I, I can't see. So we had to do quite a lot of work to try and keep people engaged throughout that process of not having a physical space for them to work in. Um, timeline between development and go live. Anyone that's worked on a capital project will know that absolute pain of this part. You're kind of almost ready, but you can't quite hit the go switch yet. It's really challenging. Um, and also part of our process in developing that new story um, in terms of having an Edinburgh-based collection, but really want to tell that Scottish story. How did we pull in stories from, from other areas and how we've managed that is using imagery, um, speaking to people from different areas, using their experience, using them in quotes, using images of those locations is kind of how we've managed that. And also developing relationships between a cohort of volunteers that have been around for a very long time. A lot of them have fire service experience, but also kind of wanting to broaden our cohort of volunteers as well. Um, you know, get local people involved, people that are interested in, in museums and heritage. Um, and I think, we, you know, that's a long process. It takes time to develop those relationships. And I think for us, it's kind of building in enough training time um, to give people that opportunity to learn from each other. Um, you know, it takes a long time, it doesn't just happen overnight, so it's kind of building in enough time to do that um, so that people feel comfortable and feel content when they are in the space, if they're being asked you know, to deliver a guided tour, for example, making sure that they're comfortable and also that it's okay if somebody asks you a question, you don't have to know the answer to everything, it's okay to go and approach someone else in the organisation and say, I don't know the answer to that, can you tell me or can you explain? Um, it just kind of makes that process a little bit more... Um, informal and less scary I think. When I joined the fire service I, I didn't know anything about the history of the fire service so I've had a lot of learning to do and it's really people like Jim that have taken the time to sit down 
and work through that with me to help me build up my own knowledge, which, you know, I'm so grateful that we've got a cohort of volunteers that were able and, and willing um, to do that. And I would say that we've learned a lot of lessons. Advocate frequently and early. The earlier, the better. Find the person, the highest person you can in your organisation and, and make contact with them. Share lots of images, share stories. Um, just try and get them on board. Our personal mantra is the job still needs to be done, even if you're working with people who it's maybe not high up on their agenda. We still are tasked with opening a museum, so we kind of have to find a way to circumnavigate some of that process sometimes. That's re that's the most challenging bit of the process so far, I would say, but yeah, we just keep repeating that mantra to ourselves and, and forging on. Personality clashes will happen. Um, it's inevitable. I'm sure anybody, um, you know, that's worked with volunteer cohorts will will know that, um, you know. And I think you have to have that clash and then find a way to move on and remain professional and remain respectful. Um, you don't have to get on with everybody. You also don't have to like everybody, um, you know. But you, you kind of just have to be focused on the task in mind and also. Um, I think it was Jim that said this to me was be present and be open when I first started working with our volunteers I was quite distant from them um, and I started attending our museum store once a week every Wednesday to work with them and build up that relationship and I'm so glad that I did that before we really kicked off the development phase because it meant that I already knew most of the people that I was going to be working with and I had a bit of a relationship and a bit of an in it also you know, I don't know how it was from, from your perspective, Jim, if that was something that was helpful for you. It was just nice to see somebody in management, you know, that could put their side over and say, well, we're not doing this, we're doing that. And that's the way it's going. You know, just a wee bit helpful on that side. But yes, yeah, it certainly it helped the volunteers. It gave them that there was somebody else there that we could turn to. And I think our advice from others from going through this process would be to involve volunteers from the start, specifically if they have that lived experience of that subject matter of that collection. You know, our volunteers have brought a wealth of knowledge that we could not have gathered, even just personal experience. Um, that has been one of the highlights, I think, of building this museum has actually been able to take like quotes directly from somebody like Jim and put it in the museum. He's had experience of using a lot of the stuff that we have on display. You know, it's wonderful. Um, support people and make them feel feel welcomed, which I think is kind of does what it says on the tin, really. Expect the unexpected. I don't think in January 2020, when we were discussing plans to go on site, we knew that it would be two years later. Um, you know, we could never have planned for what happened, um, you know, and we had to just adapt as the process evolved, like everyone else in the country in every aspect of life, you know, we're kind of evolving on a day-to-day -day basis. And the other thing that I want to say is socialising. So people volunteer for lots of different reasons, but I think for us and for our cohort of volunteers, one thing that they appreciate is just getting together for, you know, a cup of tea and a cake where we don't always have to talk shop. We may be just talking about what's happening in their lives on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, um, and, and listen to people's ideas, as Jim said. So I'm going to show you an image of an appliance, the 1806 appliance. This appliance actually wasn't meant to be in the museum. We were, we hadn't selected it as an object. And when we were doing one of our kind of roundtable chats with everyone involved in the process, volunteers included, and we said we weren't including that, it went very quiet, which you know is usually a bad sign. Um, and our volunteers were like, but why are you not including that? And, you know, we kind of explained our reasons why, but what we had missed, and this is where vol the volunteers were so key, was we had missed the fact that all the original commissioning paperwork for this appliance was within our collection. So we still had the original quotes, the paperwork, and the people of Duns, where this appliance is from, raised the money themselves to pay for this appliance because at that time there was no local authority fire brigade. If you wanted an appliance in your area, you had to raise the money and pay for it yourself. And we still had the paperwork with the names of all the people in the village of Duns that paid for this appliance. So when we found that out, obviously it, was straight, it went straight in um, to the display. But without our volunteers 
alerting us to the fact that there was a wee envelope of papers in a drawer somewhere gathering dust. We would never have known that. And actually, it's it's a wonderful story overall. So, you know, huge thanks to the volunteers for being confident enough to raise that and kind of put us in our place, because I think that would have been a shame to miss that out. And that really draws us to a close. <clears throat> I've put our website there in my email if anyone wants to get in touch.